So I was thinking a bit about just setting the scene quite broadly about um, how we and I finance with sustainable development and the climate compatible future and why that's important. Um, this diagram paints a picture of the overall financial system. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, so I'll try and kind of walk through some of the key points. Um, so that little blue drop that you see in the top left is um, climate finance flows on an annual basis. Um, it's in the region of 700 plus billion dollars per year, which sounds like a large amount of money, but if you look at some of the other flows of finance, it puts it into the perspective of the overall financial system. Thank you. Um, so, for example, the purple drop underneath the green drop is annual investments in fossil fuels, and the purple drop above that is fossil fuel subsidies. So what we see is that globally the world is still investing more in fossil fuels than it is in climate compatible investments. Um, the large purple drop is the amount of investment needed to transition the world towards a low carbon um, future. So the amount of investment that we need is going to beat the targets that the world has set under the Paris Agreement which is significantly more than what is currently flowing. And then if you look at these bubbles underneath, they represent stocks of finance. So uh, on the left there, that pink bubble on the left is assets under management in 2019, which is in the region of 90 trillion. And within that, um, the, the and then on the, on the right, it's the debt securities outstanding. And within that, you can see the green and climate aligned bonds is that small green bubble. So it's a very small percentage of overall um, uh, uh, debt securities. What, what this figure shows is the, the world's most profitable companies. And what you can see there is that our biggest our most profitable company in the world is Saudi Aramco, which is the Saudi Arabian state owned oil company. Um, and they make a whopping 300 million in profit per day. So that it's just to put into perspective, if, and if you look at the, the companies on this list, you can see that it's mostly oil companies and technology companies. So the world is but we're still investing heavily and making enormous profits through companies that are not necessarily generating positive good for the world. <clears throat> so climate change is often talked about as a major market failure because in principle um, we know how to address the problem of climate change. From a technical perspective, um, even uh, from a financial perspective, we have a lot of the solutions needed to address the problem of climate change. And yet, we are not making a lot of progress in addressing this challenge as a, as a global community. And that is partly because of the political economy around the climate change challenge. So this, this little cartoon kind of points to, to that uh, political economy dynamic that even though a lot of the technical solutions are out there, the political will to address the problem often isn't necessarily there. And it's also a connected action problem. So it's not just about you know, a major event like the United States or the European Union deciding to make a decision to take action, but it's about every country in the world coming together and, and deciding to take action on climate change. Because um, a molecule of carbon dioxide emitted in the United States, you know, goes into the atmosphere and affects the whole world. And it's the countries that are the least developed, the communities that are the most vulnerable, that are usually the most affected 
by the impacts of climate change, not necessarily those that are the biggest contributors to the problem. Um, so what is the world doing about climate change? Well, you've probably heard about the, U the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is one of the, this is the main global body that um, addresses or that collectively brings governments together to respond to the challenge of climate change. It was established in 1992 and has been holding annual meetings called Conferences of the Party or COPs. Um, every year since then, except for one that was missed during COVID. Um, and the Paris Agreement that you've no doubt heard about is one of the big milestones that was agreed under the UNFCCC. And what, <coughs> what this Paris Agreement does is firstly it sets the goal to keep global climate, global warming to 1.5 to 2 degrees above pre-industrial temperature levels. Um, and then it also it has a, a goal to align financial flows with low-carbon climate resilient development. So if you remember that diagram I showed at the beginning, um, where you see that climate compatible flows of finance are a drop in the ocean of the overall financial system. The Paris Agreement aims to shift that to get the more consistency between what we value as a society and where we put our money. Um, now, what the Paris Agreement does, um, and you, you may have heard about the kind of protocol which came before the Paris Agreement, and that set goals for developed countries to reduce their emissions of, climate, of, of greenhouse gases that cause climate change. What the Paris Agreement does is it doesn't set specific goals for specific countries, but it rather gives every country the chance to set its own goals. Now, what, what that resulted in was often lauded as a triumph of multilateralism because the Paris Agreement succeeded in getting all countries on board, which has never been done before in the global climate um, agreements, and then the Kyoto Protocol didn't include all countries, which was one of its biggest weaknesses. But as you can imagine, if countries are allowed to set their own targets, it doesn't necessarily mean that the world will achieve that two degree goal that the Paris Agreement sets. And that is exactly the problem. So countries set their goals through what, what are called nationally determined contributions, their national commitments to take action on climate change. But if we look at all of the NDCs that have been um, submitted by countries, they don't collectively bring us to a place where we're on track to meet that 1.5 to 2 degree goal. So although it's, it's, it's been successful as a multilateral agreement to bring countries together, it hasn't yet reached a point where it's successful in actually combating climate change. Um, and one of the provisions in the Paris Agreement is that every five years there is a stock take and countries revise their nationally determined contributions with the aim of increasing ambition. Um, Now, if we look at the financing of the Paris Agreement, what we can see is that um, current climate finance flows are down here on the left in the region of, you can see that that number is going up. It's now in the region of um, about seven or eight hundred billion US dollars per year, but it still falls far short of what is needed reach the Paris Agreement goal. So we need about a tenfold increase in the amount of funding that's um, being provided annually to address climate change. So how are we going to globally reach that goal? This, this is a diagram that shows how climate finance flows globally. And you can see that it's quite a complicated arrangement. So on the left here you've got the sources of climate finance, which include the blue ones are 
public sources, and the orange ones are private sector sources. Um, and then in the middle, you've got the types of instruments from grants to um, debt instruments and others. Then you've got the uses. Adaptation is activities that help communities and economies to respond to the impacts of climate change that are already being felt. And mitigation activities are those that reduce the sources of greenhouse gases that cause climate change. So of course mitigation is extremely important, but for vulnerable countries like Namibia that are not major contributors to climate change, um, but that are already feeling the effects, adaptation is a much more important priority. But as you can see, if the amount of funding that's going to adaptation is less than 10% of the total amount. So it's a very, a very small amount, and that's a problem for vulnerable countries. And then on the, on the far right here, you can see the sectors, and it's primarily energy and transport and short, the short mitigation sectors. Does, it, does anyone here want to hazard a guess as to why adaptation gets so little of the total finance? Any guesses? <laughs> yeah, you um, In all honesty, there's no um, returns. In exactly, there's no returns. So the private sector is not investing heavily in adaptation because it's not easy for them to make a profit from it. So what we can see is that the settings that transport and energy, where there's a lot of profit to be made, are attracting a lot of private sector investment. And that's why we're seeing a lot of funding flowing to those sectors. But in adaptation, that's not the case. So that's something that collectively we need to work on to see how we can um, create incentives for more investment in adaptation. <clears throat> so for Namibia, um, climate, Namibia is obviously very vulnerable to climate change, and we've seen the effects of, um, of droughts, we've seen the effects of flooding or erratic rainfall, and climate change disproportionately affects the communities that are already the most vulnerable, including farming communities, people that depend on subsistence agriculture, people that live in formal settlements, people that don't have um, a source of income that would allow them to find alternative means of making a livelihood if they lose their crops, for example. Um, this slide is a little bit outdated. We, we Triple Capital developed this analysis in 2021, and we're in the process of developing a revised version. But it, sh it shows Namibia's uh, climate finance needs. Um, this comes from our 2021 NDC. So it was estimated that it was 5 billion. That has now been increased to 15 billion US dollars. Um, and we did an assessment of the overall climate finance flows in the review, which was roughly 10 billion um, over a five year period. A 10 billion million dollars. And then we looked at the gaps between the amount of funding needed and the amount of funding that's currently flowing. And we found that for all sectors, there are significant gaps, but for some sectors, the gap is more important than others. Um, as I said, this, we'll be updating this analysis before the next COP, which will take place in, at the end of November. So where, where can this funding come from to fill the gap? Well, there's public sources of funding and there's private sources of funding, as I've, as I've mentioned. Um, and different funding sources have different um, objectives in providing funding. So there's the mission focused funders, which includes uh, governments, um, uh, development finance institutions, and so on. Um, and then there's the, the profit focused um, funders, which generally includes um, commercial institutions like commercial banks, uh, private institutional investors, asset managers, 
and so on. But then there are also some that uh, there are some public funds that are somewhat financial reserve returns focused, like pension funds. Um, and then there are some private funders that are mission focused, like philanthropic funders. And there are different ways of tapping into these different types of funders, which we can go into more detail in the discussion. So why should the private sector invest in addressing climate change? Well, these are a few headlines that have come out in recent years that show why there might be an incentive for the private sector to engage in um, climate change uh, funding. So for example, there, there have been trends that show that ESG aligned funds can outperform um, non-ESG funds, especially during high ends of downturn. So for example, during the COVID crisis, ESG funds proved to be more resilient than traditional investments. Um, for, for, ins for insurance institutions, for example, there's often an incentive to um, invest in uh, ESG and, and uh, climate change investments. <coughs> Sorry, because climate change poses a real risk to the assets that are insured. So if you don't consider climate change in assessing risk premiums and so on, they could lose out. Um, and then there's also the risk of stranded assets. So that those are investments in, for example, in, um, in, the, in the fossil fuel industry that because of new policies and responses to climate change, so those assets are no longer financially viable to exploit. So if firms have invested in you know, oil fuels that then become too expensive to invest, to, to exploit commercially, then that's what's called a stranded asset, and that's expected to increase. Um, what can governments do? Well, there are a number of levers that governments can use to, to shift private sector um, action, including uh, policies and regulations, um, uh, fiscal policies for tax incentives, um, using their own public finance strategically to de risk private sector investment and informational instruments, um, like disclosure requirements, requiring, for example, financial companies to disclose their climate related investments or their investments that are at risk. And finally, what can you and I as citizens do? Um, well, there are a number of ways that we can take action. One is just by being a conscientious investor and being aware of what your financial investments and expenses are being used for and what impacts, positive and negative, they may have. Uh, being a conscientious consumer and citizen, engaging your government on policy, um, raising awareness in your professional and social circles, um, and undertaking business in a responsible way, of course, contributing to the tax base. Um, I'll stop there, and we can continue the discussion in the next session. Thank you.